Hey guys, in this video, we're gonna be talking all about cortisol, the things that elevate cortisol, the negative symptoms of chronically elevated cortisol, and some simple things you can do to start to regulate the production of this stress hormone. Cortisol is an important steroid hormone that belongs to a specific class of steroid hormones known as glucocorticoids, which is secreted by the adrenal glands in response to stress. And although when chronically elevated, cortisol can have many destructive effects on the body, the fact of the matter is cortisol still has many important roles in regards to normal physiological function. It regulates the blood sugar in our body and tends to rise when our blood sugar is too low. Cortisol does act as an anti-inflammatory substance, especially when progesterone and thyroid are deficient. It plays roles in fat, carbohydrate, and protein metabolism. It does affect immune function, and perhaps more than anything else, it helps to activate the central nervous system when the body is in a state of very intense stress or in a life-threatening situation. So although we want to keep cortisol levels regulated and in check, Think of cortisol sort of as an emergency stress hormone, meaning that when your body is in inescapable stress, if you're in a life or death situation, you want cortisol to be secreted and produced to ultimately help your body survive in numerous of different ways. However, for most people, the problem with cortisol isn't that they're not secreting enough. There are certainly incidences where people do experience an insufficient amount of cortisol production, whether that's from not consuming enough cholesterol or taking anti-cholesterol or cholesterol-lowering drugs. The fact of the matter is people usually are deficient in other hormones like thyroid and progesterone, not as much as they are deficient in something like cortisol. So I think the concept of adrenal fatigue paints an inaccurate picture. Most of the time, people that have adrenal fatigue are told that they're not producing enough cortisol. But the fact of the matter is, cortisol is something that you don't necessarily want to rely on all of the time. Most of the time, people with the symptoms of adrenal fatigue are often progesterone deficient and thyroid deficient. So keep in mind that cortisol and the whole adrenal system only tends to activate when progesterone and thyroid are low. As I've talked about in videos in the past, Progesterone is the primary anti-stress hormone. It's not just a female hormone, just like testosterone is not solely a male hormone. Men and women both need progesterone and testosterone. In fact, in regards to men's health, progesterone is often a precursor in the hormonal pathway to the production of testosterone. But for basic physiological purposes, progesterone actually acts as an anti-stress hormone. And only when progesterone is deficient will the body rely on cortisol to cope with stress. So again, cortisol is more of an emergency hormone. You want to more so rely on the activities of progesterone and thyroid as primary anti-stress hormones to cope with stress rather than cortisol. So if you've been told that you are not producing enough cortisol or that you have adrenal fatigue, I would also have your thyroid checked and progesterone levels because more often than not, it is low levels of these hormones that tend to give rise to all of the symptoms associated with adrenal fatigue. So also keep in mind that the adrenals and the thyroid work in tandem. So usually the adrenal system is not activated by way of the hypothalamus and pituitary unless thyroid function is low. So low thyroid function usually activates the adrenal system, vice versa. Turning down the adrenal system and the overstimulation of the adrenal glands often helps to take a burden and stress off the thyroid so that way the thyroid can work optimally. In fact, and as we'll discuss in greater detail in a moment, one of the basic ways to help lower chronically elevated levels of cortisol or to correct hyperadrenalism, so the overstimulation of the adrenal system and these stress hormones like cortisol, is to actually boost the activity and the functioning of the thyroid. So looking at some of the primary causes or reasons that cortisol becomes chronically elevated, other than low thyroid function or hypothyroidism, one of the other major causes is high estrogen levels. And this is because estrogen not only impairs thyroid function, lowering thyroid, but estrogen can actually act on the adrenal system by way of the pituitary gland. It sort of has a feedback loop with cortisol, stimulating the production of cortisol. In addition to hypothyroidism and high estrogen levels, one of the major causes of elevated levels of cortisol is actually low blood sugar. 
Remember, cortisol and your blood sugar have an interrelated relationship as well. So if your blood sugar drops, then cortisol is gonna rise. So oftentimes, dietary stressors can be a major cause for high cortisol levels, not just because of the various toxins and pesticides and herbicides and other inflammatory substances in a lot of food today, but if you're eating foods that disrupt insulin secretion and that disrupt your blood sugar, these things can also lead to a cortisol spike. Also, if you're skipping meals, if you're not eating frequently enough, or if you're eating a diet that causes a drop in your blood sugar, or if you're fasting, anything that chronically lowers the blood sugar is gonna cause a spike in cortisol and trigger the stress response. Aside from these things, any sort of toxic substance is also gonna contribute to the overproduction of cortisol. So this brings into play the various environmental toxins, herbicides, pesticides, vaccinations, fluoridated water, a lot of medications, EMF, radiation, and again, the various and countless environmental toxins could also trigger the secretion of cortisol. So these are really just examples of stress, various examples, everything from physical stress to physiological to dietary to chemical stressors, even to radiation or thermo stressors. And since most modern people are exposed to more than one of these things, usually at a time, it's no wonder why chronically elevated levels of cortisol is such a prevalent and epidemic issue for people. But getting into some of the negative effects of high levels of cortisol and some of the adverse symptoms one might experience from high cortisol, the first that you're gonna run into right away is any sort of diabetic-like symptoms. And this is because cortisol can actually impair the cellular utilization of glucose. So most of the symptoms of diabetes or insulin sensitivity or any sort of hypo or hyperglycemia could be directly related to high cortisol levels. In fact, one of the major biomarkers of a diabetic other than the elevated levels of free fatty acids is sky high levels of cortisol. So diabetes could be a symptom of high levels of cortisol, chronically elevated levels of cortisol, I should say, but all the symptoms of diabetes could also be signs of high cortisol. So any sort of wasting conditions, the atrophying of the skin, not only does cortisol impair the regeneration of the skin by inhibiting protein synthesis, since the skin is made up of protein, the impairment of protein synthesis can impair the skin's ability to regenerate or rejuvenate, but cortisol in of itself is actually very catabolistic to the various tissues in the body. It can actually break down and waste the skin tissue and attempt to turn it into glucose to feed the cell during stress. So this is another way of saying that cortisol can lead to accelerated skin aging, wrinkling of any sorts, interference with normal and healthy wound healing, which is also a symptom of diabetes. So ultimately, again, all of the symptoms of diabetes can be directly associated to the high levels of cortisol. In addition to these things, you're also gonna likely notice hair loss. So as we talk about in the Forever Healthy Hair course, high cortisol levels is one of the major reasons for all sorts of hair loss through various negative effects in the body. Again, depriving the hair follicle of glucose, interfering with thyroid function, amongst many other negative effects that interfere with good hair growth. Other than that, high cortisol levels could actually lead to osteoporosis and the increased rate of bone loss. And this is through usually the cortisol's effect on the stimulation of estrogen and also prolactin and parathyroid. So cortisol has a feedback loop with these other hormones that tend to lead to bone loss by deranging calcium metabolism and again leading to a wasting condition not just of the bones but also the skin. And lastly, another major negative effect or symptom of high cortisol is immune issues. So as we learn, cortisol can waste and damage a lot of the tissues in the body and some of the major tissues that cortisol is known to shrink and atrophy is the thymus gland, which is an important immune gland, as well as the lymphatic tissue. So the lymphatic system is like the sewage system of the body. It's incredibly important for good immune function as well as the thymus gland. And cortisol, when chronically elevated, can interfere with the healthy function of both the lymphatic system and the thymus gland, which can lead to a whole host of immune issues. So with all this being said, you're probably wondering, well, what can I do to lower the cortisol? Because the cure is in the cause, and since we know what causes high cortisol levels, we ultimately have the cure in our hands. So thinking back to some of the primary causes of high cortisol levels, the major one is low thyroid function. So taking proactive steps to optimize thyroid function is key. There's tons of things you can do to help thyroid function, Lowering cortisol actively and directly can help with thyroid function. So we'll get into some tips, some herbs and things you can do to lower cortisol. But thinking about the thyroid first, 
we know that there are very simple things you can do to improve thyroid function. In terms of what the thyroid gland needs to produce thyroid hormone, you need minerals like selenium, copper, zinc, magnesium, and iodine. And you can find all of these minerals in things like shellfish. So shrimp, oysters, and other sorts of shellfish tend to be really great foods for thyroid function. I would highly recommend consuming those a couple times a week. In addition to that, the thyroid gland also needs sugar. You need glucose, the liver needs glucose, aka sugar, to convert the thyroid hormone into its active form. So a low carb diet is one of the worst things that you could do for hypothyroidism. It's a great way to give yourself hypothyroidism in fact. So for more dietary tips, definitely be sure to grab one of our online courses which will teach you how to eat properly for thyroid function. But two basic things to do would be to consume shellfish, get those necessary minerals for thyroid function, and to not go on low carb or ketogenic diets. It's a bad idea for good thyroid function. I've proven it many times in these videos. Aside from that, we also know that high estrogen can stimulate cortisol. So taking proactive steps to lower estrogen is also gonna be essential be sure to reference these videos or again just grab one of our online courses. In addition to that, we know that low blood sugar is a major cause for high cortisol. So as mentioned already, get in healthy sugars to regulate the blood sugar and suppress cortisol. So you're going to want to get sugars from a natural source. You're going to want to get the right type of sugar because not all of it's created equally. To learn more about the best forms of sugar to eat, again, grab one of our online courses to learn more. But I would highly recommend as a tip to stick to more simpler sugars over starches. For example, a piece of white bread is about 50 times more insulogenic than a piece of fruit. This just gives you an idea where to start. In addition to these tips, some very simple things that can directly lower cortisol, I'm going to recommend some of my favorite herbs which have been clinically proven to lower cortisol and also aid thyroid function. The best and my favorite is KSM 66 ashwagandha, which has been clinically proven to lower cortisol by 20 some percent. It also improves thyroid function. Aside from ashwagandha, both ginkgo biloba and cordyceps are clinically proven to suppress cortisol levels. So these are three fantastic herbs for anybody with hyperadrenalism who's overstressed, who has too high of cortisol levels. These herbs can directly lower cortisol levels, which will indirectly improve thyroid function. So to quickly recap, the things you're going to want to do to regulate the overproduction of cortisol, bring it back to a normal range, is take care of the thyroid, lower your estrogen levels, regulate your blood sugar, make sure that your blood sugar is not too low, and then also take some of the anti-stress adaptogenic herbs that we discussed that lower cortisol. Other than that, if you want more tips, a more thorough explanation about how to regulate the production of cortisol, or if you want more tips on all of these areas, again, head to our online wellness academy and enroll in one of our courses, which will give you an in-depth look at to how to regulate thyroid function and balance the hormones in your body, and specifically lower cortisol. Otherwise, that does bring this video to a close. If you found it helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're new here and you wanna see more videos just like this. And last but not least, for referencing any of the studies or for checking out our online wellness academy, our blog or tonic herb shop, you can find all of these resources in the description box below.